Welcome to the Principles of Performance podcast, where we discuss how to optimize your health, fitness, and performance. Drawing on decades of experience of working as coaches, consultants, and trainers to top performers, athletes, and teams from professional sports to top universities to the U.S. military, Eric Degatti and Mike Perry discuss topics and strategies of how to perform at your highest level and be your very best. Join us and our friends and colleagues who are leaders in the fitness and performance industry as we investigate and challenge the most popular training, nutrition, lifestyle, and recovery protocols. And away we go. Here we are with the Principles of Performance podcast. I am your host, Eric Degatti, along with my friend and co-host, Mike Perry. Mike, you ready for another good one today? We have landed uh, in an old friend of mine. Uh, I, I've known Dan for, gosh, more than 10 years, and uh, he's one of the good guys. He's one of those guys that has just been putting out just good quality content just over and over again, and uh, he's super consistent with that stuff. So I'm excited to have him on board. It's uh, This guy is an absolute gem in the industry, and I'm excited about today, man. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm pumped too. And so when we're putting together the the notes and I was doing my research, trying to nail down, all right, well, what do we talk about? Because he's just got such a, a wealth of information. I decided I'm going to lean into golf because, you know, as of this recording, we're just about starting to finally get some sunshine here in the, in the Northeast. It's uh, guys are itching to take their clubs out. So we're going to talk a little bit about golf because that's one of the things he's really, really good at is golf preparation and, and keeping golfers pain free. But let me give you a little background real quick. So Dan uh, Swinsco brings it, he kind of brings this unique perspective to solving movement problems. And he spent oh, the past 30 years, not only just treating, but learning from his patients. Some of the, you know these patients include uh, athletes from the NFL, MLB, WNBA, pro golf, and, and as well as local doctors, families. He's worked with them all, so, but we're going to focus a little bit on golf today because he's uh, spe he's specially trained and certified from TPI, Titleist Performance Institute, and Golf Digest as a golf uh, medical and golf fitness professional. Uh, he also has certifications through NSCA, FMS, SFMA, FRRR, FRC, USAW, on base. I think we're out of uh, out of things in the alphabet there, Dan. Um, and then he he uh, is also a guest speaker to PT schools and pro and college sports teams and a bunch of big organizations. And so uh, if I kept going with all of his qualifications, we take up the whole show and we have a ton of stuff we want to learn from this guy. So Dan, welcome. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Very, very cool. So Dan, we are going to dive right in, buddy. So we know that you've worked with athletes from, gosh, very, very different sports. But today we're going to start with golf. What are the key differences between a recreational weekend golfer and a pro? Um, I would say the, 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 the fundamental difference between those two groups is the baseline level of fitness because, you know, the, the average person that golfs is kind of like the average person. And with 60% of our population being, you know, diabetic or pre-diabetic, these are usually people who don't have a high level of fitness. So the, the recreational golfer that wants to play better golf, really we're training them, almost like you train anybody else. So much of it is just fundamental, you know, hinge and squat and lunge and push and pull all the, the fundamentals um, and get them just stuff like, can you walk 18 holes if you want to? Could you, you know, do you play golf without Advil or with Advil, <laughs> you know, things like that. And whereas when you've got a pro pro player, they have uh, usually a pretty significant level of fitness some amount of training background. What's really interesting with those to me is some of the guys have been given great advice. They saw someone say someone like you, they trained with somebody who understands a lot. <laughs> Don't look so surprised. And they, um, they have great fundamentals and then we're just keeping it going. Whereas other ones, like I had a guy that it was a college golfer a few years back and he was doing these rounded back deadlifts and wondering what, you know, recognizing deadlifts were important, but he hated them because they hurt. I'm like, is that how you did them? Yeah. Is that how everybody did them? Yeah. And your coach is there with you? Yeah. I'm like, okay, let's start over. And so, so they, they had a training history, but really the, the skill level wasn't there, but, but by and large, the, the pro guys usually have a pretty impressive 
uh, fitness resume to start with. And then Joe Average oftentimes does not. And so you just kind of have to dial it down to the level of what they have when they start. All right. So I want to go right into the deep end here and, and talk about the danger of making assumptions. And so on one side, having worked with a bunch of pro athletes, we often make the assumption that, all right, when this person comes in, I'm going to be able to use all the cool tools that I've been seeing on Instagram and YouTube, and I can't wait to do them with this pro athlete. And you're jumping ahead, not realizing that even though they're a professional athlete and they're really, really good at their sport, they still not be able to touch your toes or rotate or do some very fundamental things. And so all those tools are going to have to take a back seat to some real fundamentals. And so we can't make that assumption based on what their handicap is or based on how much they get paid per year that we're going to automatically be able to jump into like the really cool, sexy stuff. Right. Yeah, it's so true. And, you know, when you first start seeing those higher level athletes, you almost have this expectation of, do I have enough knowledge to challenge them? And then you just start doing through super fundamental things. <laughs> this will not be a problem, <laughs> right? Because I think in oftentimes, the high, especially guys at, at pro sports where they're famous, they're wealthy, people shy away from coaching them. And I found those people love to be coached really strict, really hard. They want that level. And that's one of the things that they like and they come back for is because I don't give them any free pass. It's like, good is good. And I don't care what you get paid. If you can't hold your foot flat on the ground while we're doing this, get that big toe down and let's get some control and earn the right to be advanced, right? Because sometimes they can, you know, as you know, great athletes are great compensators. And so if we can take away that need for the compensation, we might be able to help them get even another layer up. Okay, now let's go to the other side of the coin. And, and Mike and I ironically just had this debate the other day is we is we're kind of preparing some curric some curriculum stuff for for uh, our course as we said all right so let's play this scenario out let's say you have uh two people come in doesn't matter male or female but they're they're two people of the of the same gender that come in and they're same uh medical you know medical and fitness background they're pretty much beginners pretty much sedentary one has a goal of fat loss one has a goal of improving their golf game. How much different are those programs really going to look when they finally get on paper? Uh, so both of them are basically the same physical person, but two different goals, like identical twins, but one wants to play golf and the other one just wants to lose weight or get better body comp. And they're both, and, and they're both relatively beginners, relatively sedentary. I think the vast majority would be the same. Yeah. It's and and most, but unfortunately, what are most trainers and coaches going to do? They're going to take the golfer and they're going to do quote unquote golf exercises. They're going to take the fat loss person and have them do burpees till they puke. Right there, it's 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 taking them immediately jumping ahead to the goal without understanding the person. Right, yeah. and so that that kind of leads into my next question. All right, when we let's bring it back to golf. All right, golfers we know spend a ton of time and a ton of money putting into lessons and buying all the latest gear and explain how that, that $400 driver could be a complete waste if they can't do something as simple as like balance on one foot. Oh my gosh. The, the example that came into my mind before you even finished your question was exactly that. So I'm seeing a gentleman who is a retired fire chief, badass dude in his day. He's in his mid seventies. His retirement, quote unquote, was medical because he had back surgery that went wrong and he ended up having a foot drop bilaterally and numb feet bilaterally. He wears AFOs that for your anyone listening, you may not know what that is. It's basically a, a thin plastic sleeve that follows the end of his calf and continues under his foot. So you step on it. It's inside your shoe, Velcro's around your calf, Velcro's around your foot. And when you walk, it allows your foot to lift up so you don't drag, okay? The reason I'm seeing him is because previously I was seeing his wife and she was telling me about how her husband's super frustrated with his golf game because he's spraying it everywhere. He used to be good. Now he's not. And I get to see him. He couldn't stand still. He's literally losing his balance on his AFOs and the gentleman can't stand still. I'm like, well, how do you expect to play golf if you can't even hold still to address the ball? And so we've just been doing super fundamental stuff with balance as you're talking about and helped him turn his foot out to get a little bit of a chance to come forward without falling or rotate through without falling forward. And we just done these ultra 
fundamental things for him because he couldn't even stand. He was on the internet. This is why his wife was saying, he's like, should I change my grip? What do I like, dude, <laughs> whatever grip you have doesn't matter if you can't hold still to swing it. And or if you're trying to swing it, you're just trying to stand up long enough to make contact before you lose your balance and have to catch yourself with a step. So just getting a base for that guy has made a huge difference and getting a little bit of hip mobility so he can turn without pulling himself over with his own tightness. So that's the other extreme. Like he literally not only could he not stand on one foot, he couldn't stand still on two. And wow, he's trying to that's crazy. I mean, and that's the thing people don't understand. It's like, you're right. Uh, people will spend 400 bucks on a driver, but they won't actually hire a coach that knows what they're doing. And, <laughs> and at the end of the day, you can buy as many drivers as you want, but it's not going to impact your movement. But if you can impact your movement first and actually start to move well over time consistently, that driver is going to be worth a lot more. And that's the thing people don't understand because it's, it's not a quick fix. You can't just buy a new body and move well tomorrow. It's not for sale at Dick's. So right. that's the thing people don't truly understand. But, you know, when it comes to when it comes to golf in general, um, a lot of people have low back stuff going on. Right. And I mean, how many times have we heard people say, I've got a low back issue or I've, I've got, you know, slip discs or herniated discs or I actually have low back stuff. So let me ask you this. And obviously we know the answer, but I want to hear you explain it. Um, <laughs> how do we differentiate the difference between a true low back issue and um the low back being a result of doing something it was not designed to do. Um, if I'm hearing your question right, I think I might answer them the same way. If you're saying it's not designed to do, meaning like your lumbar spine is meant to be a stable place. And as an example, your hips are supposed to be a mobile place. And when you sit all day on your hips, they tend to lose mobility, right? And so we all sit a lot. And so if we've got a person whose hips don't move well, and they've got a sport that requires hip movement and they don't have it, well, then that movement is going to go somewhere else. The next thing up the chain, of course, is lumbar spine. And if you're twisting through your lumbar spine repeatedly in a ballistic fashion, sooner or later, it'll start to complain. Um, if that's what you're referring to, then I would say that person has a back problem because their back hurts. And if they get an MRI, they'll see whatever it says. But the root of the cause is their hips, and which it almost always is. And I see you smiling because you and I know the same thing. If the things that are supposed to be mobile aren't, then the things nearby that are supposed to be stable can't be because the movement's going to come from someplace and no one wants a smaller swing. So you, you might have the mobility for a putter swing, but you're trying to hit a drive. Well, how the heck are you going to solve that puzzle, right? The elbow's going to break down and they're going to twist in places they shouldn't. And they're going to do a number of things just trying as hard as they can to find a way to generate power and get the ball out there somewhere. But if we start finding the things that are stiff that should be mobile and start improving them, then that back pain, whatever it might say on the MRI or whatever diagnostic label might be attached to that person almost always cleans up. So I'm going to, I'm going to add in uh, something else there. So, you know, we, I've been in the industry 20 years, you guys have been in it, um, you know, longer than I have, we've seen this pendulum of low back health, right? It seems like we're in this area where it's like, do whatever you want. It's kind of like that family guy thing where it's like, how do you lift things? Well, just bend over and rotate in a fast twisting motion as fast as you can, right? So there's sort of this idea that it's just like the body will adapt. Just keep on beating the hell out of it. And it's like, uh, well, Maybe. there needs clarity. So how, how can we differentiate the difference between compensation and positive adaptation? Well, I think um, compensation will be immediate and adaptations are going to take time. So if you're one of those people, bend any way you want, do Jefferson curls with load and stuff like that. Like, all right, first of all, we have to decide what are we trying to accomplish with that and why? If you're a Cirque du Soleil performer, I could see that might be a useful task maybe. Uh, um, but you would also start, so, you know, nobody's done it until they've done it, right? So you would start super light, super temporary time and build duration and, and, and all that. So if you want to do something that some people might think is crazy, I suppose you can create adaptation. I say, when you do hard work, you don't get those calluses the very first day, right? It takes time to make them adapt. You don't get a nice tan the first moment you step out in the sun. It takes time to adapt, but you're going to compensate the second you have to. And so if I don't have mobility and I'm going to go swing a golf club, I'm going to find a way to do it by hook or by crook. I might be hating myself after, you know, 18 holes, 
but I accomplished the task because your body is always going to help you accomplish the task because that's what you said you needed. Now, if you are 20 miles away from being able to swing a golf club effectively and you're out there doing it anyway, I don't think you're going to make adaptations. I think your body is just going to break down. I think that will probably happen first. So um, in my opinion, and I think if you want to have the mindset of you can do anything, just give the body a chance to adapt. Then you say, okay, are you willing to be patient and incremental and wait the months and years for that to occur? Or do you want to just improve your mobility, maybe change how you do things and get results a whole lot quicker? All right. So I want to kind of circle around with the, the in, uh, injury stuff. And, you know, if, if we were all kind of talking back room and talking sexy with each other, we use terms like regional interdependence. And the concept of what you talked about earlier is that you have these stacking mobile and stable parts that should be doing what they should. And if they can't, it's going to lean on the next one. And getting the understanding of where some injuries have upstream effects uh, or upstream causes that are causing downstream effects. And so a great example I thought of this morning uh, that I wanted to bring up today uh, was with a client. I was having him do some half kneeling rotation. And every time he would reach back with his lead arm, he's like, oh man, I really feel my bicep here. Is this supposed to be in my bicep? And I said, yes, you could feel your bicep and you're not wrong in feeling that, but that's not what our goal is. And then I basically just, you know, put my hands lightly around his rib cage. And I said, I want you on your next breath, breathe out and just turn your ribs more and don't worry about your arm. He turned another 10 degrees and he's like, the bicep went away. And I said, what happened there? He said, I don't know. I said, well, because it's not because your bicep was the problem. It's that you were and you were overreaching with your arm because you're under rotating through your trunk. And when you under rotate through your trunk, now your arm's going to get the gist of it. Now, if he goes out and golfs with that scenario, doesn't know any better. Now he shows up in your office with golfer's elbow a couple months later because he's had these negative adaptations. Talk a little bit about how that whole downstream effect kind of happens and what you end up getting as golfer's elbow. You now have to explain to the person that this isn't really an elbow problem. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you're hit it right. And so like, for me, if I think stereotypical golfer's elbow, I think somebody who doesn't transfer weight very well. So stereotypical golfer's elbow is going to be the inside elbow of the trail arm. And so as a right-handed golfer, right arm is the left to your left. And so stereotypical golfer's elbow, as they're coming through, they're basically doing this with their wrist to try to propel the club face instead of turning with their hips and lower body and having that come in last. So a lot of times what I do with people is get them connected to a pro at the same time as they get connected with me. I said, not only are we going to clean up your golfer's elbow, but we're going to help you hit better than you have before. So with, again, the, the downstream effect, if I can't find power out of my lower body, all I got left is my hands. And so you're going to try to propel that nice long lever with these muscles that were meant for fine motor, not for power production. And so that will break down pretty fast. But in my world, I help them feel what it's like to get into their lead side. If they have limitations, we clean those up with manual therapy or whatever. And then lots of drills to reinforce what does it even feel like for you to transfer your weight from your right to your left, from your right to your left. And there's lots of ways we can create those feels in the gym and then say, now I usually, I've got a, a number of clubs here with no heads on them. I said, I want you to just make a swooshing sound and just start to go through and feel how you can lead through and hear how that swooshing sound is there and try to get them to do that in a ballistic way and then send them to the pro. And then the pro kind of does what magic they do with helping them understand their grip and the club face and all the things they need to do to sequence it, to hit a nice crisp, crisp strike. But most of the time with golfer's elbow, the elbow hurts. The problem is down below, the stuff down below is not working and all they had left was this. And um, we want our, 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 our hands to control the angle of club face, not propel it. Propulsion happens with all the bigger muscles lower down. All right. So it's very cool that you segued into a, 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 a nice, elegant introduction and overview of what the TPI model is, right? It's this body swing connection. And you mentioned about how you're working with the golf pro or the skill coach and you're getting that appreciation and understanding for that intimate interrelation of your body's movement and then the mechanics of your swing, understanding that, you know, I explained to, to my clients that, look, they're, they're, you're, you know, what is it that your instructor is asking you to do that you can't? 
And sometimes they'll say, well, I'm asking, I'm trying to do this. And I'll say, well, look, you, you know, you have all the movement to do that. That's a golf problem. You just suck at golf. Like that's your golf pros problem. Right. Um, or I'll say, you know what? He could tell you that all the time. You could take all the lessons you want and he can give you all the drills in the world for that specific swing flaw. And they're never going to work. And you're going to both get frustrated because you just, you're just never going to get there. It's like, he's speaking to you in a language that you don't understand. So talk about that body swing connection. Yeah, um, I use as a great example, like many from Greg Rose, Greg Rose, is such a bright guy, but he showed at one of our TPI seminar uh, seminars um, at a time when Fred Couples was number one in the world. And they showed where his shoulder position was at his backswing, which for him was more like this. And then some guy named Eldrick, I guess he's pretty good. Um, they showed Tiger Woods, he was number one in the world for only forever. Um, they showed his position of his shoulder in his backswing, which is back like that. So Tiger had much more external rotation and then Fred was actually internally rotated at the end of his backswing. They both were number one in the world and they were profoundly different. I said, if you're trying to swing like Tiger, but you're Fred, you will not be number one. In the world. And if you're Tiger trying to swing like Fred, I'm sorry, if you're Fred trying to swing, you get the idea of what I'm trying to say. Because um, your body physically cannot do that. And so you have to make sure that what is being asked of you with your golf swing is what you're physically capable of doing. And for whatever reason, I send more people to golf coaches than golf coaches send to me. So I don't see a ton of people who have a golf coach in the, the example that you gave, but I love to refer them out and say, look, we're going to help you get your shoulder move better if it can, or if it can't, um, we'll say, you need to find a pro who can teach you how to swing in a manner that you're actually physically capable of. Because if your body physically can't go there all the drills in the world like you said it's like you're speaking a foreign language you're not going to be able to do that but there's more than one way to skin you know skin a cat and you can just learn how to swing in a manner that allows you to do what you're capable of and you'll have success that way now mike before you jump in i'm gonna i'm gonna keep going on this point because a lot of people may be listening the golfer listening to this may be saying okay we well, you know what I'm hearing, Dan, say I need more mobility so I can get into these positions. So that means I need to get a bunch of stretches right but understanding that movement is is two sides of the coin, that it's not just mobility, there's also stability in motor control. Motor control is being able to get in that position and then be able to own and control that position throughout the entire range of motion. And so that control comes with learning, motor learning, and it comes somewhat with practice. Like I joke when I talk about motor learning and, and what I'm teaching is to say, look, I have the exact same swing as Tiger Woods once every 10,000 swings. He has it once every swing, right? So that's the difference. So talk a little bit about the the misunderstood and sometimes completely glossed over concept of motor control and 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 how we have to have stability as much, if not more, than than mobility sometimes. Yeah, I'm glad you went there. Um, and I would say as you ended more because just watch the champions tour. Those guys are elite. They don't move as well as they used to. They used to be the 30 year old number one in the world. And now they're 55 and not number one in the world. They're still pristinely talented at golf, but the body's different now. Right? So they have stability, but they don't have the mobility, but if something feels or looks tight, it may or may not be tight in a way that stretching will help more often than not. I had a, a, a new patient this morning. It was her hips, same thing. She's had back surgery and back and leg pain. And she feels tight all the time. And I had her move and I said, well, it looks like, like your hips are tight, but you also look like you could have been a gymnast in high school five years ago. I'm guessing your hips are going to probably be pretty mobile when I put you on a table. Let's see. And sure enough, they were. So I said, your hips feel tight, but they are not tight. So what does that mean? If your hips are tight, that means they won't move very well and they'll feel tight to you. But if they feel tight to you and they move fine, that is a stability problem. So when she's on the table and I move her leg for her, it goes everywhere. When she stands and she tries to rotate, she goes about three quarters of normal. So when gravity is loaded on my body and my brain has to tell my muscles to move my bones in a certain way, it's kind of like a puzzle. Can my brain figure that out or can it not? And if you go part way and you feel tight, or even if you go a normal amount, but it still feels tight, if that's an abnormal sensation, that shouldn't be there. And if I can put you on the table and move fully and you feel nothing, then I can guarantee you that your problem is not going to be solved by stretching because you move beautifully. Your problem is going to be controlled by helping your brain figure out how to make your muscles 
move your joints in that manner in a normal fashion so you feel normal and we just give them whatever assist they need to make that happen and gradually it starts to just come into play love it love it so we're going to talk a little bit more about you know working with golfers and and one of the things people don't understand is it's it's pretty taxing at the highest level especially when you're dealing with you know tournaments or the entire season um you know they need to be prepared for a combination of power endurance fine motor skills you name it what are the key things that they need to be focusing on what are the most important things on that checklist to make sure that they're health healthy for the duration of the season great question um at the pro level you know i'd think it recovery is important those guys so much of it it, it really is a, an entirely different world the pro level managing their schedule managing their workouts with travel and time zone so you'll notice how many of the guys on tour wear a whoop strap um, or some sort of wearable. I actually have a or a ring. That's why I'd rather wear a, a ring than a bracelet. But same sort of a concept where they're monitoring heart rate variability. They're monitoring their sleep. They're doing all those things. Um, that's just really important to know if when you've got a tight window and you're on property Wednesday through Sunday in a perfect world, sometimes Tuesday through Sunday, if there's a pro-am, you just never know. You just don't have a ton of window in a work week where you can really hit it hard. And so just knowing when you can, and then it's also knowing the golfer, you know, just like if the three of us magically had the ability to be on PGA tour, you have your injury history. I have mine. Eric has his, we're all going to have our little things. So, you know, when you've got your things, you work on your things <laughs> and then you can kind of plan the year in advance and say, okay, if we know we're going to be in these three tournaments, time's going to be tight so let's do our routine maintenance stuff work on your things make sure you're there and do what you can and then you have a two-week window off okay in that two-week window now we can do these other things and work there so when it's at that level it's so much of it is is travel related um and recovery and just staying fresh and really being really good about the the sleep the nutrition the hydration and those kinds of things when it's that level um, we have not worked with a lot of PGA guys, but we've worked with other guys at the other, if you will, minor league professional tours and the lower level you are kind of like in minor league baseball, the facilities you have available to you range widely from zero to nice. And so we also help our guys have things like, I'm a big fan, as you know, of the ultimate sandbag and some of the smaller ones they work really well when they're filled with water and you can do a ton of really cool core and shoulder drills with those and when you empty the water out it's like a pair of pants in your suitcase so it'll travel you get to wherever you're going fill it up and you got somewhere around 12 to 25 pounds um, of useful challenge where you can do you know things that would think of as maintenance and and um activation and, and those kinds of things so that when they're are around that they can at least do those sorts of things but i think uh, um, understanding travel and trying to figure out where are you going to be, what are you going to have access to is a big deal at the pro level that we don't have that problem for the rest of us. Hey, everybody, a quick break in the action here. Hope you're enjoying the show and we appreciate you listening. We're working hard to bring you the highest quality content and best guests every single week. So if you could do us a big favor and go and like and subscribe to the show on whatever platform you get your podcasts on, it would be greatly appreciated. Be sure to listen at the end of the show also to find out more information about our courses, as well as a special discount code for all our listeners. Thanks again, and let's get back to the show. So a couple follow-ups to that. So um, one, and this is really at any level, and Mike kind of touched on it, is understanding the energetics of golf and that we only see, okay, well, how much time is actually involved in swinging the club, right? Over the course of 18 holes, it's probably a couple minutes at best, right? In terms of actual work. But if you're someone that's walking the course or doing those sorts of things, sorts of things and you're doing it in heat and you're going up and down hills, there needs to be some level of conditioning within there. And yeah. so let's talk a real, you know, real quickly about how that gets overlooked sometimes in terms of building a good base of, of that, uh, you know, aerobic and anaerobic conditioning. Yeah. So for the, again, at the pro level, it's really their practice. They're, they're for hours and hours and hours that the, the type of personality that not only are you a physical freak to have the ability to do what they do, they're kind of mental freaks too, to be willing to work as hard as they do on levels of minutia. Um, one of the guys we work with, he spent probably five hours on a putting green. 
can you have you ever tried putting for five minutes it's tiring <laughs> so um the amount of time that they spend in practice so i think the the training effect is that but i where i think you're going through question though is yeah you have to have power you have to have endurance of it you have to have a fundamental base of your aerobic fitness because you are out there for hours um for the competition you're also out there for you more hours when you consider practice time and so the the fundamental baseline of just a decent aerobic base um is useful for everybody at all levels but yeah what's required of them you know from the ability to walk and have um you know the mobility to handle um a ball above your feet or to get in and out of bunkers and odd things you know it really is fingernails to toenails and working you know everything all the way up now the other thing i'm thinking of is and we you know mike talked in the beginning about the difference between the the pro and then the kind of weekend rec golfer is that the irony of this is you're talking about how much on the uh, we're talking about mostly at the macro level let's go to the micro level it's now i'm going to go play golf today you talk about how much time the pro who is an, an elite level athlete is putting into their preparation meanwhile you have guys who you know sat in a desk and chair and sold insurance all week now going to jump out of their chair pull the bag out they're going to take a couple swings that you know on the on the uh um you know warm ups and and then they go right and then they wonder why they jacked up their back or their hip or their shoulder playing golf that there's no thought put into i need to prepare and if they do maybe they pull their arm across their body and touch their toes and do a, a stretch and that's the extent of of preparation and you know i explain to the golfers that i have we need to have a very i have a specific warm up that i give them that they should do when they get either into the clubhouse or their other driving range and then on top of that i say you want to start monitoring kind of a little bit of an idea if you have the ability to have like a um, track man or something like that is even better. Like how long does it take you to really get loose? And one thing that always stood out to me uh, from the TPI power class, which was, you know, brilliantly talked by one of the greatest long drive champions in the world and how many swings it took him to get to his peak velocity. It was like a hundred something swings. So if you think you're going to go out and you're going to, you're going to hit a, a small quarter bucket of balls and then be ready to go and swing, swing your driver at the, at the first hole it's a little crazy but people don't think of it that way yeah that's a great point and you know when you're talking about somebody like that's a that's a fine-tuned engine that you're talking about that says you know it's that many swings before he's really peak 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 um what i tell the guys that i work with are golfers not guys guys and gals whoever um is that i say it like this i say if i showed you something that would take just a few minutes that you would do before you play and it's going to help you without question on a regular basis perform better and it will probably limit your injury likelihood are you in yeah well it's the warm-up i was telling you about <laughs> right so when your warm-up is kind of standing on one foot trying to put on your golf shoes at your trunk in the parking lot like that doesn't work like you're saying and um people just have to get to a point where they're willing to say okay if i tee off at three i'm getting there at 2 30 or earlier and then they can comfortably pay for their round, get ready, do a movement prep that I show them, hit balls on the range, hit some putts, get in the sand and have an opportunity that when they're on the first tee, now they're mentally and physically in a place where they can perform at their best. But if you're going to complain to me about aches and pains and you're coming to see me and you're trying to shoot better scores and you're a trunk slammer showing up and rip it and rip it, what I show you to do is not going to help very much relative to those other things. And those are free. Okay. So now let's talk about a little bit of the anatomy of a, a training session with a golfer and immediately everybody's head goes to, and I alluded to this earlier of stuff that looks like golf, right? We're going to attach rubber bands to, to, to golf clubs and we're going to do everything, all these different million different rotational drills, but how much of that do we actually need versus just good general physical preparedness and understanding that golfers still need to squat and lunge and hinge and, uh, you know, push and pull and all those things as much as they need to rotate. Yeah. Um, what I would say is this, I'll, I won't use where I live now in, in the Phoenix area as an example, because you can play year round. Um, but let's say where I used to live in the Pacific Northwest if you play in the winter time, it's a slop fest. I mean, theoretically you can, if you find a day where it's not rare training, but everything's muddy and icky and the ball plugs and it's just not pleasant. So there's an off season, right? I'm going to do more of those rotary power things in the off season because you're not swinging a club. 
But when you get into an in season and you're swinging more and more and you're going to the driving range and you're playing, then I'm going to do those things less and less. But the, you know, the fundamentals that you're talking about, a squat and a hinge and things of that nature, that's a part of everybody's program because that's just a part of what you need to do to be an athletic human at golf or just about any sport, but golf for sure, we need those things. So they're always going to be a part of the programming. Just what we emphasize might be where you are in your season. Okay, so now let's talk about day one. And well, it's not just day one, as we'll get to in a second, but it's the assessment process. All right, how do I even figure out what it is that you need? So talk a little bit about your assessment process and what that looks like and um, and, and what I can expect to go through if I come to see you. Yeah, so if someone comes to see me, everything starts with, we call it a subjective, which is basically an interview. You just start asking the person a bunch of questions. So with my background, I emphasize injury history. So I'm asking them, you know, about their golf life, about how often do they play? How often do they practice? Are they serious? Do they have an index or they just sort of play and enjoy it? Are they a member anywhere on and on all those sort of golf related questions? And then like, so what brought you here was playing better? Or is it, you know, what's important to you? Is it distance? Is it hitting more greens, hitting more fairways, just out driving that one friend who's obnoxious? What is it? And then um, their answer to all those questions, especially when I talk about injury history, and um, I used to, to have um, an intake form that I would go by and the person would fill it out. And as time goes by, you know, you get smarter as you get older. And I realize people only tell me what they feel like telling me. They don't tell me everything. So now I'll look at that and then I'll ask them questions from the ground up. How are your feet? Your feet hurt? Well, actually I had some plantar fasciitis last year. You didn't write that down. Well, I didn't think it related. Well, guess what? I'm asking anyway. So we're going to look at your foot, your arch of your foot and your big toes. And do you have a particular pair of golf shoes that you wear that is the most comfortable or do you care? Do you have, you know, and I talked to him about that and I say, okay, ankle history. You played other sports when you were a kid. Do you have any ankle sprains? How do your ankles feel? How do your knees feel? How about your hips? Do they, if you squat down, do they feel pinchy and tight or do you squat freely? How about your lower back? Have you had history there? And I literally go body part by body part by body part. And I just kind of grill them because people forget or they want to get to everything that you were talking about. They want the rubber band on the golf club and they want to do the, the slam ball stuff because they perceive that as what they wanted to get. But the reality is I want to know about their injury history because I'm not going to believe that you've recovered from that until you prove it to me. And if their injury history is more significant, then I might decide, even though you're a golfer, I might do a Y balance test on your first day if you've got a lot of lower body stuff or something of that nature. So my assessment morphs based on the stuff that you tell me, but more than likely an SFMA will be with everybody. So we look at fundamental ranges of motion everywhere. Um, and then my, don't tell Titleist, but my, my my TPI screen on day one is sort of hybrid TPI FMSE. So I just sort of, again, kind of look at a variety of different things and just start to try to see if I can get some idea of how they are as an athlete. So everybody gets an FMS and then I start plugging in the more golf specific ones as needed. And I say as needed because if we're talking about Joe Average, Joe Average is not going to look good on the SFMA um, and they're not going to look good on the FMS. So just by doing those things, I've found some target areas where I can help them move better and improve in golf and in life without even having to do that much more. I'm happy to do more. It just kind of depends on how much baggage they bring in to see me. So, you know, if they've got the old XYZ injury in their shoulder, their back, their neck. They had a car accident a couple of years ago and they've got this really limited compact swing and they're trying to hit the ball further. Well, gosh, let's, let's look at all of this stuff, but I also don't want to spend an hour on assessment, make you feel like you have 37 things wrong with you and never have time to train and actually get started. So I kind of, the evolution of my eval is we're going to do as much the first day as we need to, to get a sense of, of the bulk of your issues or what I would kind of try to prioritize and see, we've got some things we know we need to work on and then give you the opportunity to start working on those and, and understand what you can do on your own at home. Or if you have a gym membership, what you can do on a gym. And if we have some particular thing, we might want to do here that things that we can do together. And then we just keep digging deeper over time. But if you're really pristine, if you really move well, um, and you've got a pretty high exercise IQ, you know, the difference between a squat and a hinge and a rep and a set, and you know, what's going on, um, boy, we might, we might get down to really get down to brass tacks. It just kind of depends on where you are, because if you're a really high level golfer, 
um, I might get you on the table and really look at some minutia where if you're not, there's going to be things that I can do to help you where I can see you from 10 feet away. I don't need minutia for that person. All right. So let's go a little deeper down the assessment rabbit hole. So there's, there's two sides of the coin with this as well, is that on one side, you have people that look for problems. I always say they look for problems that aren't really there. And this is one of the mistakes I see, especially in our world when fitness professionals try to apply the SFMA. Because the reality is the SFMA was designed for people in pain. Well, if I come to you, right, Dan, and I'm not, I'm pain free, I'm doing what I want to do, and I'm playing how I want to play. And you, but you could still put me through an SFMA and find me dysfunctional in a bunch of those, especially the deeper breakouts. Is that really a problem? Or are you just going to end up now giving me, you're going to try to justify a bunch of corrective exercises in your head that you're going to give me that aren't really going to be all that impactful, right? Yeah, so, so don't talk about not looking for problems that aren't there. You don't want to be chasing ghosts, right? So um, I will probably do the SFMA on you anyway. I won't necessarily tell you what I find. Right. Just because I find it doesn't mean I need to point it out to you. So, um, you know, as you know, using it, there are some things that are dysfunctional in a glaring manner. And there's some things that are dysfunctional a little bit. Right. There's even though that you have one score, some are pretty close. And so if I do an SFMA, just because that's kind of how I roll, I like the information it provides me. Um, and I see some things that are really mild. You're in zero pain, like you said, and the SFMA is a clinical exam meant to be to see you in pain. I'm probably not going to use that information very much with you that day. But then if, again, if you're not in pain, you move pretty decently, we'll go through, we'll do the full TPI screen, depending on our time and what you do, we might do some power things. We might do a full FMS. It just kind of depends. Again, I hate to say it depends because it, it sounds like a cop out, but I don't do the same thing with everybody because what you tell me and what you show me lead me in one direction a little more than the other. So I'm not trying to dodge your question, but I think your point is well taken is if you do an SFMA and you find something that's dysfunctional, non-painful, you're not obligated to chase that, I guess is one way to say that. Um, yeah, and, and I don't think it depends as a cop out though, Dan, because let's say I'm doing your 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 extension test, your, your overhead reach and extension test in the SFMA, and you can't even get your arms up overhead. Now, am I going to lay you on your back and have you take a, a medicine ball with 20% of your weight and have you whip that in a TPI power test? You couldn't even get your arms up without anything. So obviously right. that's going to have to change my, my process, unless you're an idiot and you're just going to plow ahead anyway. Yeah. And if say, let's say in that example, I say, were you even aware that your arms don't go any higher than this? Oh yeah. Just, well, is there a possibility that might affect your golf swing as you're kind of coming over here and maybe some of that slack could be uh, useful for you. So maybe we might want to work on that as it might relate to your swing. And then you can take them to a lat length test and something like that and make it a little more related. But um it definitely, you do need to, I think, um, take all of those things into account. What you choose to tell the person also kind of depends on how you've sort of ferreted out their personality. If some people tell me, yeah, I have an L3 this and an L4 that, and I have this and the MRI said this and that, they've been hyper-medicalized that I don't want to, I, that for those people, I'm not even going to mention a bone. I'm going to say arm. I won't say humerus. I'm going to say tummy. I'm not going to say core. I want for them to not feel so hyper-medicalized um, if they've kind of gotten that. You know what I mean when I say that? There's some 100%. people that are- Yeah, and, and they're also lot. looking, to, there's a little bit of, they're looking for confirmation bias in there too, right? They're hoping that, oh, I have this physical therapist who's going to now justify and say, oh, yes, doctor in, in the MRI said I have a low back problem. Now he says I have a low back problem. I knew it. I'm a low back problem, right? And you yeah, don't want to feed into that, I, that, I that broken mentality. 100%. And I tell you, you know, we treat you, not your films. And I always remind people of how easy it is to do an internet search to find symptom, uh, asymptomatic people, MRI findings of any body part you want to list. And you realize that pretty much everybody's got something, right? And so it is very common for people who feel fine to have, have MRIs that don't look fine. And so I just remind them of that and say, you know, okay, you know that you've got that but you're able to move well. You already told me nothing hurts and you just want to golf further. It doesn't mean we can't train. It just means you've got something that someone took a picture of and we'll honor that. We're not going to do anything stupid, but you don't also don't have to be worried about that. You're doing okay. And I think a lot of times I try to kind of talk people off the ledge if they're, you know, afraid to be able to do something because they have this thing that was seen on an MRI. 
And fortunately for me, I've got enough things wrong with me. I'll say, yeah, check out this. That's me. <laughs> and look what I can do, right? So um, particularly when I'm small and not hyper muscular. So I say, look, if I can do this and I can overcome these things, it's not like I was born with a lot of these physical gifts, right? So if I'm an ordinary guy and I can do it, you can too. Okay. So we're going to yeah, come back so, to that and come back to that in a second. I want to, I got a couple okay. more assessment ones though, first, Mike. So on the other side of that coin though, is um, we sometimes jump steps here, right? We, we do it the exercise because we want to jump to the sexy sports specific stuff and exercise. We also sometimes do it with assessments, right? So if you have a golfer, I'm going to skip all this SFMA and FMS, and I'm just going to go right to the TPI screen. And you said, uh, you know, very elegantly, I might not even get to that because, you know, and I had this discussion, um, Greg had me speak to to the group, one of the first on base courses, because it was a lot of the baseball people saying, okay, this now I don't need to do the FMS, this is the base, this is FMS for baseball. And I had to explain to say no, a lot of things that you're going to find in this screen could have been fixed because they have poor leg raises and shoulder mobility and those things. Now, once you've cleared the FMS, now you can start to go a little bit deeper into some specific things. But until you've cleared your basics, gotten kind of your ABC, so to speak, we don't need to go and get all fancy with your sports specific testing until you've kind of cleared this hurdle first. I think Gray once said, I thought this was pretty cool. I don't remember if he told me this in person or if I saw it somewhere else, but it the FMS is not sports specific, it's species specific right? It's for people and be a functional, <laughs> relevantly functional human being first. And then we can take that to a sport. We might look at you a, a little sharper under certain ways based on your sport, like with the on-base university stuff or TPI or golf digest or what have you. But um, still it's the body you take to the golf course. And everybody that I see, I also tell them, I said, now you're here for golf, but that back pain with golf does that bother you when you take out the garbage, when you pick up your kid, when you do laundry, when you go to Costco and unload your car and like, yeah, all that stuff. So it's bigger than golf. Right. And so I think um, it's the point is well taken, but also, you know, you, you only have so many tools in the tool chest. So the more tools you have, the more freedom you have to understand when is it the time for the hammer and the saw and the screwdriver, but some people don't have those. And so I think that's kind of nice. You kind of joked about my, my credentials. It just means I've been here a long time. And so um, the longer you're in the game and the more different tools you learn how to use, you can kind of adapt. But um, I'm happy to run an on-base U screen on you or a TPI screen on you. But based on what I found with other stuff, I may not need to do that. And like I said, if I clean these other things up first, then it will look a whole lot different. I want to do the screen when the screen is going to yield results that I don't get with other stuff. We don't want to waste time. Absolutely love it. So uh, look, if we're being honest, most physical therapists don't lift. Right. Like like most physical therapists don't know much about strength training. And then there's guys like you that have done powerlifting and you've done all these bike trips and you're kind of a maniac. I've known you've done a ton of kettlebell stuff over the years. Um, how have these experiences and, and your own aches, pains, injuries, experiences, et cetera, helped make you a, a better clinician, practitioner, whatever you want to call it? A ton. I think um I don't know when it was, but somewhere along my path professionally, I came across some smart personal trainer somewhere and it just became very clear to me that the culture of my profession was you are a physical therapist, you are going to learn from physical therapists and you're going to learn from medical doctors. And no one ever explicitly said that, but that was just kind of the culture and when you allow yourself to realize that you can learn from anyone anywhere and you can apply things that really help a lot, I cannot tell you how much I've learned from you, from Eric, from people in the FMS world, from people in the Strong First world, on and on and on before Strong First even existed. Um, it was, it, it's, there's so much you can apply if you're interested in learning it. And there's so much more you can apply better if you've trained it. And so, you know, I think it was around the year 2000, something like that. Uh, do you remember the year Strong first started? I I really don't know. I mean, I got certified in 08 with the with the RKC. So it had to be three, four years after that, I would imagine, right? I'm not quite sure, to be honest with you. Brett, Brett would know. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, not long before Strong first started, um, I got my first kettlebell certification. And I remember... Um, Gray actually was the first person I ever saw talk about a kettlebell. And in my mind, I'm like, 
why do I need a kettlebell? I can use a dumbbell for everything he just showed me. And then I put one in my hand finally, and I recognized the difference one once I felt it. And nothing's been the same in my life ever since. Same thing with the sandbag. I think there's a lot of exercises that um, you can't recognize how amazingly effective the ultimate sandbag is until you train with one and feel the difference. And so getting certified in that and having the opportunity to teach that, certified in kettlebells, having the opportunity to teach those things helps a lot. And then of course, when you train for it, and you work and you fail and you train harder and then you work and you fail and you train harder and you eventually achieve some things with barbell um, or kettlebell or what have you. Um, if every PT had to know how to do a Turkish get up with at least 25% body weight before they graduated, it'd be a different world out there. Um, it's, it's just amazing all the things that you learn when you train. And of course, I've had my fair share of injuries. So um, when you have an injury and you have to overcome it you get again another level of understanding of what it's like to live in the skin of somebody dealing with that and a lot of tips and tricks that you never learn before you learn because you have to uh, and then you can apply it to people so um, anybody who wants to talk painful shoulders I'll talk to you you know I've been there down that road on both sides uh, and overcome a lot of stuff without surgery and, and doing fine knock on wood um, same thing with knee um, my knee was supposed to be replaced a long time ago. And since it was supposed to be replaced, I summited Mount Rainier. I did the Grand Canyon in one day. You know, I did a powerlifting meet. I rode my bike on uh, Seattle to Portland in one day. You know, a number of different things that are physically demanding um, with a knee that was supposed to be ready for the trash heap. So um, you recognize that, again, you're a person, not a film. And the film said the knee was ready to be replaced, but my function says it's not. And so uh, I'm going to listen to my function. And that's extremely powerful when you're talking about the ability to relate and connect with your patients and clients and getting them. So you have a better appreciation, A, of the timeline of things and the frustration that they're going through and the and the um, the feelings that they have, that they do feel broken and that they do feel not what they used to be. And they went and they're scared that they may not ever get back to that. And then also being able to show them, you know, how you've overcome that and being able to know that. You know, that that what most of my colleagues are doing of ripping that sheet out of the cookbook to say, okay, knee injury means you're going to get TKEs and, and clamshells, and you're going to get this, and you're going to do that until your visits run out, as opposed to saying, okay, well, you're going to do this, and as soon as you're good enough, I want you to be able to do this, and as soon as you're good enough, you're going to do this, and that's the steps to get you from where you are now to where you could potentially be. So kind of talk about how you can use that to inspire and motivate and progress people really, really well, not from the, the clinical side, but more from the mental side. Yeah. And I think that's huge. And some of the really rewarding feedback I've gotten from patients, they tell me, you know, you've given me hope for the first time. That's a pretty heavy compliment, you know? And it's because they tell me, yeah, gosh, you know, the doc said my knee's bone on bone. I said, me too. What? Yeah. No, no, no. It, I've got really advanced arthritis and yeah, pull up your x-ray. Show me. Want to see mine? And I show them and there's my spurs. There's my no cartilage. And what did you do last year? Oh, you know, I'll tell you what I did last year. And I just say, you know, your knee is this really interesting joint that's got this stuff above it, like your hip and your core that matters a lot to how your knee feels. I got these things below it, like the arch of your foot, your ankle and your big toe. Those things matter a lot, how your knee feels. Now, did the person who told you you should throw away your knee, look at your big toe, your arch, your ankle, your hip, or your core? No, of course not, because they looked at you through this little myopic lens and just said, you're a knee, and I'm going to x-ray your knee, and I'm going to MRI your knee, and I'm going to replace your knee if you let me. And I said, you, there's so much more to your knee. And I said, you know, if my knee was supposed to be replaced years ago, and I was able to do all these things without pain, mind you, I'm not taking drugs. I'm not loading up on Advil, then putting on my backpack. I just go. And, and I've got a 20 some year old daughter who I can keep up with. And not a lot of dads can say that. And it's not that she's not fit. <laughs> she's a stud. Um, but she and I, she's my hiking buddy. We go hiking together and she doesn't have to wait for me. I can keep up with her. Um, and not because I've got, again, all these physical gifts. It's just that I understand how my big toe affects my knee and how my arch and my ankle and my hip and my core. And I put energy into making sure those things work well. And if you do that, I believe you can be like me too. And the second you give them hope, now suddenly they're willing to try. And you let them know that some of these things might hurt a little bit, but if the pain is mild and you're willing to continue, see how the fifth rep feels relative to the first rep, because that might be your brain just saying, 
I'm not so sure about this. And then after a while, nothing bad happens and the pain goes away and you find you can continue. And the next thing you know, you can even add more weight and make it harder and you can progress from there, um, baby steps along the way. But um, using my injuries to help them is, is, has given me some incredibly sincere um, thanks from people who for the first time thought maybe they can overcome this because they really didn't believe they could. Uh, and most of them do. And it's really cool to help them get through that. I really appreciate that. And, and uh, thank you for sharing that because most people, when they get into our field, they think the cool stuff is the stuff behind you, the signed pictures, this the, Inst the Instagram selfie with the, the sports star. The cool moments are those, like capture those in a bottle. Like when you said that, it immediately brought me back to a guy I was working with. And this is probably maybe almost 20 years ago. The guy was a tree logger. And he'd been like to every single person for his back and no one was able to help him. And he did an exercise. And I remember I saw a tear in his eye and I'm like, oh shit, I just hurt this guy. What did I do? And I'm like, you all right? He's like, I'm great. He goes, this is the first time I felt useful in a long time. And like that, that was like, holy shit. Like that's what I'm doing this for. You know what I mean? And, and so that's, what's really impactful. Now, yeah. uh, completely changing gears. Funny story. Cause I made it, made me think of this is when you talk about PTs learning from PTs. This is something, and, and, and trainers learn from trainers. This is something I broke that rule a long time ago. And back in the days before there was anything, webinars, before anything, it was like you get that threefold pamphlet in the mail, right, for whatever course it was. And there wasn't that many courses back then, where now there's a course every everywhere you turn. There wasn't many courses. So if you sent me a pamphlet in the mail, I signed up. And so I went to a course, and it was on stability ball training. And I walk in the room, and I remember it's a big ball room in Newark, and there's like 100 people in the room. And so they do a survey. They're like, all right, how many physical therapists in the room? And they go, all these hands go up. And I'm like, anybody who's not a physical therapist, and I put my hand up, I look around, I'm the only one who's not a PT. Same thing in reverse. Any clinicians so, in the room? Yep. Yeah. So, so now fast forward to lunch, and the woman teaching the course is a really sweet woman. She pulls me to the side. She's like, um, is this uh, too much? Is this too advanced for you? Is this Is this okay? And I'm like, and I wanted to be like, nice and say, no, it's, it's great. It's great. I said, actually, I, I've, I've done some more advanced stuff too, but this is good. She's like, well, if you really like the advanced stuff, you need to check out this guy, Paul check, Paul okay. check. And, and at the time he was the, the, he was the thing. And I was at my second level of his internship. I'm like, well, I've actually <laughs> done, I've done two levels of Paul's internship. <laughs> so she goes, you know, Paul check. I'm like, yeah, I just spent eight, five days with him in Encinitas. She's like, oh, we, and, and I'm not kidding, Dad. We come back from lunch. Everybody's, and she goes, everybody, before we start, we have a very special guest in the room. I want to introduce, <laughs> and she goes, and he's worked with Paul Check. And now all of a sudden, I'm JoJo the circus clown doing stability <laughs> ball tricks for everybody because I was the one guy. Because these, these PTs were like doing like the most simple things, like pick up one foot on the ball and they're falling down and then like going to a push up and they're like shaking like, like there's a hurricane in the room. And it's like, Oh my gosh, is this what's happening on the other side? So I figured I'd share you do appreciate that story from back in the day. Sure. It's, well, it's, it wouldn't be hugely different now. I think the tide's starting to turn, you know, one of the cool things about having my daughter go through PT school is you get a vision in right. And then between her and her friends, seeing what they learn when they're coming out of school versus what I learned when I was coming out of school, it's definitely better than it was, but it's still, as a rule, the physical therapy profession is, is way under what I think expectations should be in the understanding of how to handle load and the, the loads that life sends your way and how to prepare people for them. It's, it's not as good as it needs to be. So um, I take great joy in helping people understand that. Um, I also, when I'm, when I'm working with patients, I almost always grab a weight when we first start a little heavier than what they'd be willing to get on their own, just to watch their eyes get like that. I'm like, you all right? You think I'm all right? I was like, I know you're all right, or I wouldn't have given it to you, but I got this one on purpose because I knew if I asked you to pick a weight, you'd pick this little pink thing and I'm picking this big metal thing, right? And so um, it's very cool um, to be able to do that with people and then to, to train PTs to understand how to load confidently so that they can put some weight on people and train them appropriately and not have everything be, you know, really small and full of minutia. Awesome stuff. So, uh, you know, look, we could keep you here all day, Dan. So, but before we wrap up, Perry, do you have anything you want to add into the mix? No, I, I think the only thing I'll add is I, I, I hope he'll come back and, and allow us to pick his brain again, because that was phenomenal. Thank you so much.
Yeah, absolutely. So, so in the meantime, tell us about what you're working on now, Dan. Tell us what you got in the immediate future in the, in, in your plans. Uh, well, uh, my daughter and I are working here in, in Scottsdale, at, uh, doing business as Train to Win, and we're doing rehab and performance. So again, the the spectrum of does it hurt or not, and can we help you move better, feel better, play better? Uh, that's been a lot of fun. Um, I've just started trying to help more people through the online world like everybody else seems to be doing. So I created um, a website called Fix Your Function. And so you go to fixyourfunction.com and the one I have now is shoulder. And there's a class on if all you have is, is elastic bands. This is kind of COVID motivated. If all you have to exercise are bands, how can you get a decent training effect in head to toe? So I've got those two. And then we're pieces are in way of, of working on the lower back and the hip and the knee and so on. We'll work our way through the body part where you can just follow the bouncing ball and have a means by which you can assess yourself and say, okay, is this okay? Yes or no. If yes, do these things. If no, do those things and just move along so people can learn how to kind of fix their function and work on the problem of not, I have a rotator cuff tear, so it hurts. Work on, I'm unable to reach overhead. And if we think of it as I'm unable to reach overhead and we look at what's required to do that and see what you don't have and train those things, then next thing you know, you do that. I'm no longer worried about whatever injury may have brought you there because half the time people have stuff involved that you don't even know about anyway. And I think exercises that do this with a band don't have a lot of value. So we do a lot of other stuff instead. Love so it. Sim looking to expand. Love it. Simple elegance. And so we'll have the links to all that stuff so people can check it out and find out more because you are certainly a wealth of information and definitely, you know, we'll have all the social media links because he puts out awesome content, as Mike said early on. Um, so thank you, Dan, for your time. Greatly appreciated. Awesome seeing you. And want to thank everyone for listening. And this has been the Principles of Performance podcast. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Principles of Performance podcast. If you've enjoyed our content, please like and share on your social media outlets as well as subscribe and give us a review on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or whatever your preferred platform is to listen to. For more information on the Principles of Program Design courses and workshops, visit us at www.principlesofprogramdesign.com and follow us on all of the social media channels where we post new content every day. To save 10% on any PPD courses, enter the discount code PRINCIPLESPODCAST10 at checkout. If you have any questions we can answer or suggestions for the show, you can email us at info at principlesofprogramdesign.com or message us on social media. Thank you again for your support.